collection of projects. I'm Christine Yee, winner of last year's competition, and I'm so excited to introduce you today to some of America's top teen scientists and innovators. First up, let's talk about something important to all of us, the environment. I have some finalists here who are doing work that benefits all of us and our planet too. Let's meet them and learn why their research is making an impact. Let's start with Ichika. You developed an environment-friendly, cost-effective, and clinically safe face mask, which is effective against both environmental pollution and viruses. At the beginning of the pandemic, there were supply chain issues with masks. How could your mask meet that challenge? Yeah, so N95 masks were in high demand due to their incredible filtration efficiency. So I added nanoparticles onto regular surgical masks to improve their filtration efficiency while still keeping them cost-effective. I also worked on improving the reusability of these masks while keeping them safe so they could be reused to prevent further shortages. Awesome. Okay. This one's for you, Emily. Fast fashion and textile industries contribute to 20% of industrial pollution by releasing toxic azo dyes. Your research looks at how activated carbon might be a solution for dye removal. How do you see your findings being implemented in the fashion industry? Yeah, so Activated carbon is really special because it has two roles that it can use, both adsorption and photocatalysis. So with these different ways of removing different kinds of azo dyes, how I would see this being implemented in a fast fashion or a textile factory is if there are dyes being created and released, then hopefully this release can be into a separate storage facility unit where that wastewater can then be treated. And once we, conf once we can confirm that the wastewater is no longer toxic or harmful to the environment, it can be released back into the environment. Awesome. Okay, next I have a question for Joe. Your research investigated magnetic fields and how they might influence birds' migrations. Can you briefly explain your research and why should we care about the migratory patterns of birds? Yeah, so basically for my research, what I did was, yeah, um, I basically looked at how a weak spot in Earth's magnetic field, known as the South Atlantic Anomaly, may influence the migratory patterns of some long distance migratory birds and what I essentially found is that as the magnetic strength or intensity of this field has been decreasing over the past few decades these birds have tended to shift away from that area and this can sort of impact I guess this helps us better understand where they might be shifting to and allows us to see if endangered species um, might be moving their habitats or shifting more outwards away from this field and allows us to better help them and protect them if needed. That's amazing thank you. Next up, Vivian. Vivian, your research found that formic acid, which is used to kill mite parasites and bees, hurts honeybees, potentially leading to colony collapse. What alternatives are there for mite treatment in bees? We can look to other mite control methods, such as oxalic acid or even thymol. But what I think what would provide the best long-term and effective solution is if we stray away from chemical heroicides and transition to biological methods, such as developing a vaccine against the formed wing virus following the first recently approved vaccine for bees against American fowl root disease. Awesome, great to hear. Now let's turn our attention to Lavanya. Lavanya, you developed an IoT solution to measure, predict, and mitigate methane emissions in landfills. Tell me how your system works. Yeah, so my system has a lot of components, and the first one is my Fugitive Emissions Monitor, which is my FEM, um, and this has the ability to actually send a lot of these landfill gas parameters. So um, I can actually take all that data, and then I'm 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 actually able to um, to be able to like uh, wirelessly transmit that data to an IoT cloud dashboard, and then use that for um, a lot of like almost like uh, data analytics for the landfill engineers to be able to capture all this methane and then um, harvest it. So yeah, thank you. Awesome. The next question is from Marissa. You created a tool to understand the factors that affect the endangered southwestern willow flycatcher in its habitat. How could your findings be used to bring endangered species back to their native environments? Yeah, so specifically for my project, I wanted to basically find out why this bird specifically was disappearing from an area it had been strong held for so many years. So in doing so, I discovered three different key parameters, which were insect availability, um, forage distribution, as well as vegetation structure. And from there, I was able to collect data and measure them and develop a diagnostic tool to effectively assess potential habitat for this bird, but also provide prescriptive land management to land managers to actually improve the habitat and hopefully gain occupancy in future years. Thank you. Awesome. And then now, Corona. For your Regeneron STS project, you studied one of the most abundant human-made materials on Earth, concrete. Construction has a huge impact on climate change. How could your work help develop more sustainable building materials? 
Um, my project aimed to tackle this problem by using microbes inside of concrete to make concrete a more sustainable building material. So right now we use about 30 billion tons of concrete every year for making structures like buildings, sidewalks, roads, bridges, and much, much more. However, it contributes to over 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And through my project, I was able to show that microbes exist inside of real world concrete, and we could potentially use these microbes to self-repair concrete and extend the lifespan of concrete. And we can also use these microbes to detect damage inside of concrete structures. So then this would ultimately help us uh, make our infrastructure safer, as well as uh, reduce the carbon dioxide emissions associated with concrete production. And then next up, Angela. Firefighters all around our country might be excited about your work on wildfires. Can you tell us about the nine factors that impact your prediction model and how it could help with wildfire suppression? Of course. So the nine variables that I utilized in my project are comprehensive and they cover meteorology, hydrology, and geography. And these nine variables are temperature, precipitation, wind speed, evapotranspiration, drought, land cover, fuel moisture, soil moisture, and topography. So in a real situation in the environment, these nine variables all play a part in determining whether or not a wildfire will occur and also play a part in determining how severe this wildfire would be in terms of burn acres. So for my project, I analyzed the relationships these variables had with wildfires and I created models that were able to predict, one, the probability of a wildfire occurring, and two, how severe this wildfire would be in terms of burn acres. So firefighters knowing this information ahead of time would know exactly where in California during which month and during which month uh, a wildfire would be likely to occur and also how big this wildfire would be so they know how to better allocate their resources to more effectively prevent and alleviate wildfire damages. Thank you so much. And finally, moving beyond this world, our next question is for Ariella. Can you tell us about your soil project and what it means for a potential future life on Mars? Of course. So Two major issues that must be addressed when considering a human mission to Mars are one, the harsh conditions that humans must face, and two, the extremely high launch costs, currently around $45,000 per kilogram. So one potential solution is in situ resource utilization, which would use resources already existing on Mars for human benefit. And I focused on this in terms of oxygen production. So I grew plants in various ratios of just a generic potting soil and MGS1, which is a simulated Martian regolith, or dirt. And I was able to grow these plants in my basement, and I ultimately created a, an original mathematical model, which allowed me to determine the amount of oxygen produced per plant, as well as the number of plants needed and the amount of Earth-based mass needed to produce this many plants, sufficient to, pr to support life. And so I was ultimately able to model which ratio optimized high oxygen production and low launch mass, and therefore low launch cost. And this allowed me to determine how to make oxygen production on Mars less expensive, therefore making a human mission to Mars far more accessible. Wow, that is incredible. Thanks again to all our finalists, and thanks for tuning in. You can learn more about these incredible students and their work on our public exhibitions webpage, which is linked in the Society for Science bio, and meet even more inspiring teams in just a few minutes. Thank you.